How are we doing this morning? Encounter Church, y'all doing all right? I was telling Todd, man, got in that last song, I started thinking about my sermon, forgot the whole verse. <laughs> I was ready to preach right then. Got my pink towel this morning for my sweat. Man, it's good to be with you all this morning. Um, again, I know we already prayed, but keep your, our, our pastor in your prayers this morning. He's got a team with him too, they're out. Uh, man, for a few few days this time he comes back for one or two days and he's flying out he's in Maine for you know what nine or ten days then he comes back and then he's going to Manhattan for a few more days um, he hated to miss three weeks in a row uh, but we couldn't get him a flight back for that third Sunday and so man we were sitting around talking to prayer I believe it's Pastor Nicole's idea a lot of y'all always ask for to, Pastor Nicole has an incredible testimony uh, so we're going to be doing this series it's called this is my story uh, while he's out um, next week, Pastor Nicole is going to share her testimony, powerful testimony. Week after that, Pastor Marty is going to share her testimony. Uh, that week that Pastor Marty's here, our, our children's pastor, Pastor Jonathan, is going to come in. We're going to have a special communion service that day. It's going to be it's going to be special, powerful. We got uh, Pastor Richie with us along the way too. So we just wanted a time where our pastors could share their, their story. And then on October 29th, mark it down. We all have great testimonies, but our pastor that God has blessed us with at Encounter Church has such a powerful testimony that reaches in deep into people's hearts and grabs them, the Holy Spirit grabs them and brings them to Christ. So October 29th, he will be back with us, and after that long and not being with us, he's going to be rip-roaring, ready to go. It's going to, it's going to be a powerful Sunday, October 29th, so please make sure that you're here along the way, uh, and yeah, it's going to be good. I don't know about today, the rest of them are going to be great, we'll see how the day goes. Um, but I'm Pastor Dale, um, I have a different testimony. You know, I was talking with Pastor Richie last night, and uh, he, he's a church kid like me. I was, I was raised in church. Coleman Assembly, where we started as a little kid, I was underneath those nasty orange pews, putting gum, playing with gum, writing on it. There's probably some notes from Little Dale. Uh, as long as, long as I can remember, I've been in church. And, and here's this, my testimony is going to go a little bit all over the place um, because I was praying, because I don't have, I've never done drugs, Amen thankful for it for the longest time I was like man I'll never forget when I was youth pastor for years at Bushnell Assembly of God and when we left I was just done with youth ministry I knew that God had, had, had rung that bell for me checked that off the list I had that I knew I was done and we didn't know what we were going to do next we were gonna, if we were going to start a church or what we we're praying I told Maggie you know man because Maggie's the same as me man we never been drunk never been high never smoked well, I smoked one cigarette at school so I got that. So that's my testimony. Thanks for coming out. Have a blessed day. <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't even a whole cigarette. It was one, one puff. I wasn't sneak smoking or anything. I, I, I had one puff. And guess what? I went home and my mom said, what have you been doing? I'm Christian mama, Christian boy, like walking in the door. What have you been doing? What do you mean, mama? What do you mean? I have done nothing. She said, no, you did something. <laughs> Mom, I, I smoked a cigarette. <laughs> but my, my, my story, when I left being a youth pastor, I told Maggie, I said, Maggie, this is the time. We're not pastors anyway, anywhere. You, you want to go smoke, some, like, smoke something? Drink something? You want to snort something? It's fair game right now. We can build our testimony. Everybody else got them. We can build it. Once we start pastoring again, we can't do it. This is the time. And she's like, Dale, that ain't even funny because Maggie's, Maggie just gave me a serious look. That, we ain't doing that. We ain't doing Thank God for Maggie or I might would have a crazy testimony. <laughs> now, I, want, I want to read this scripture and then I want to talk about our story because even though it's not one of what we would think of these big sins, I'm a sinner. Saved by grace. It don't matter if I've been to church. We, we, we studied it Wednesday night in our small groups. Holiness is not contagious. Judas was around Jesus like everybody else and he still betrayed Him. Right? 
Doesn't matter if you're here this morning. What matters is what's on the inside of you. Once I had sin on the inside of me, so I was a sinner. Even though I was at church, I had sin on the inside of me, and that's who I was. I was a sinner. But the moment I knelt down and I prayed to Jesus Christ to wash me in His blood and clothe me in His righteousness and in His holiness, guess what? I'm not a sinner anymore. So everybody that has that, we're all, it's all available to us. And so my story might not have these crazy things of all this stuff, but man, I was a sinner. Now I'm not. Saved by His grace. Amen. I'm going to read this scripture, and it may, might not make much sense right now, but we're going to pull it all together somewhere along the way. Daniel 3.16. If you know this story, it's an old Bible story. I think God gave me this one because my story goes way back to kids' church. Thank God for our children's pastors. Thank God for what's going on there. Because here's the thing. There's a lot of you in here... We just celebrated four years last week of Encounter Church. There's a lot of you here that four years ago, not just you, but your children were on a path to destruction. But when Christ found you, it didn't just, He didn't just save you. He saved your family. He saved generations to come. So I, I'm thankful for that, that ministry over there. And Pastor Jonathan Missy, you're able to be in here with us. But our kids, man, that's such a powerful thing. And you're changing generations to come in your bloodline. Amen. That's where it started with me. I thank God for parents that took me to church. I thank God for my, both, both my grandfathers and, and, and were, were pastors. And, and their, their wives, my grandmothers, were pastors' wives. My nana was one of the sweetest, most awesome wo woman of God that helped train me to be a man of God. And I lost her years ago, but I still re like reflect on her ministry of, of, of just love and compassion and showing the love of Christ. But I have this story this morning that goes all the way back to kids ministry, when I was in kids ministry, and, and hearing these stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and hearing it, and back then I just thought it was a story, but as you get older you realize this isn't just another Bible story or just another book that somebody reads and you, and, and you just like listen to it and, and get some things from it. No, this happened. This is reality. There, there was a time where these three Hebrew boys, young men, were, were in Babylonian captivity. And the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, built this 90-foot tall statue in his honor and, and, and built all this stuff up. And he said, I want everybody in the land, if you live here, if you're under my rule, you're going to bow down to this thing. When the music starts playing and the harps are going and all the, the drums and all the things are going, as soon as the music starts, everybody in this kingdom has to bow. This story is true for all of us, but this is my story because growing up as a Christian kid, I had to, I, I had to make a decision in my mind that whatever's going on in this world, I'm going to ask God to help me not to bow. That I made it up in my mind not to bow. So let's read the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied. They, 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 they didn't bow the first time. People brought him up to the king and he's, he's talking to him. And he's like, look guys, we're going to do it again. I'm going to give you another chance because I like you guys. So we're going to play the music again. And when we play the music this time, you jokers better bow. Because if you don't bow, I'm going to throw you into the fire. All right, good, good deal. So, all right, play the music. <laughs> Doesn't give much of a... Leeway, and the, this conversation goes on. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship your gold statue that you've set up. Pretty bold. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that, that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind them, tie them up, and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, he told them seven times hotter. The flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement 
and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the fire? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. And they replied, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. NLT, I like the other verse, it says, looks like the son of God. And so as we're reading this story, as I read this the past few days and was thinking about this story, I was thinking about my life and, and related it to that because these three young men were, were brought in with all the other Hebrew Hebrews and brought in under Babylonian captivity. They were, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar chose some of the brightest and the, the, the best looking. And that's not why he chose, that's not why I chose this because I'm not that. I'm smart some days, but good luck, good looking, and that's Maggie, but I am what I am. Um, I is what I is. No, but so he, he had all the brightest young men and brought them in and had this special case. And so he knew these young men, they were, they, 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 he was teaching them other, the, their language and trying to teach their customs to get the customs built into to the Hebrews to get rid of the old so that they could now be good servants and, and understand what they're telling them, all that stuff. And so... I was thinking about this because we live in this world, but we're called to be not of this world, right? We we're all born into sin. We were all born with the ability to do any sin possible that it's in us. If given the right circumstances, I could be anything. I could do anything. I could hurt people. I could, I could do people wrong. I could steal. All of that stuff is within us when we're born. But we have to learn how to to live in this world and not be of it. And so I, even though I was raised in church, I, I, I know as a young man I had an anger problem. If you know me now, it's, it's not there. <laughs> not that anymore. I don't, I don't get angry. I, I, I don't, I, nothing really gets my, my gears going. There's things I can get frustrated and stuff. But I, was, I was, had that anger problem when I was a, a young man. And, and I remember thinking, man, I can't have this as a, an issue anymore. And so my testimony is this. In seventh grade, uh, I was going in the mornings to Coleman Assembly of God. We didn't have a youth group. It was pretty much me and my brother and my sister, sometimes my cousins. And that was all that was there as far as kids and teenagers. So on Sunday nights, my parents would let me go to Bushnell Assembly of God. They had youth ministry over there. And so I started going there. And I, there was other people my age. I was having fun and enjoying it. And we had spring break. There was a spring break trip coming up. And on that spring break, uh, they were going to Pensacola to the Brownsville Revival. I didn't know what the Brownsville Revival was. I was, as far as my church experience, we'd go to kids' church if, I was, if we had kids' church. But usually over at Coleman, I had a little, it was before cell phones, I had a little Yahtzee handheld game, and me and my brother and sister would see who would get the best scores. That was our church experience. They were having church, man. They, it was Pentecostal church. They were out there falling in the spirit, doing all that stuff, and we were just sitting back there playing Yahtzee. And so here is little seventh grade Dale hears that they're going to Pensacola. My parents didn't let us go on a lot of trips. We, we were not sheltered, but they did watch over us, which I'm thankful for. But they, uh, I heard they were going to Pensacola. Revival didn't mean anything to me. They, there was a girl I liked in the youth ministry. So I was like, man, that, that might work. Maybe I can go for a few days. And then I was like, nah, but they're going to church. I don't want to go to church. I can go to church here. I don't have to go to church there. And then they said, well, we're going to Pensacola, so we're going to go to the beach for one day. We're going to go bowling. I'm like, all right. I'm down with that. I can go bowling with a girl I like. I can do this. I can go out to the beach. I can hang out with my friends. No, no matter for church whatsoever. But we walked in. If you don't know anything about the Brownsville Revival, it started on Father's Day back in the 90s, and it ended up lasting for four or five years. At that time, it had been going on for maybe five or six months, Bev. You're with us. It was, it was small enough. That, that we were able to stay at the church, and, but it was, it was growing momentum and just the presence and the almighty power and anointing of God was falling. And I'll never forget a youth group. There was probably 20 of us or so and some adults. We walked in that church. It was the first night. I'm like, man, why wasn't it bowling tonight? And I walk in, but when we walked in, I could feel something different that I didn't feel before. Man, just the overwhelming presence of God started touching me just as I walked on the campus. And I'd heard about it from my grandfathers, my parents, and stuff like that. Heard about the presence of God, but man, when I felt it, I just sat down. The other youth guys, they were, they were getting touched. They were up worshiping and stuff. It was, it was worship music. I, I just, like I was at Coleman, I sat down. I didn't have my Yahtzee game. A little uncomfortable, just, but I was, I was looking around and 
by the end of that service, when the worship team came back up and started singing some songs again, and other people, like even people I knew, they, they, they were weeping and ran down to the altars. And I felt something within me, and I, I just I stood up. I said, all right, God, I know you. I prayed prayer of salvation a long time ago. I feel like I'm saved. I do pretty good other than my anger. I said, but man, whatever they're experiencing, I've only seen it in adults. I've seen it in my grandparents, and I respect them. But man, I, I want to experience whatever that is. And so whatever you have for me, God, I want it. Simple prayer. And for the first time, I've been in church my whole life. I was probably, what, 12 or 13 in seventh grade. I raised my hands. And when I raised my hands, my hands just started to shake a little bit. And I closed my eyes. And as I said it again, God, whatever you have for me, I want it. His overwhelming, whew, His overwhelming presence filled that little teenage Dale. I tell you what, I was never the same again. I was never angry again. I've sinned. I've, I've fallen short. But from that moment forward, I was marked. I knew that I couldn't go back. I knew that I wasn't a normal teenager. I knew that I was different. I knew that God had a call on my life. And I knew whatever this world had to offer me was nothing compared to what He had for me. Woo! So we, we were there a few days. I don't think we ever even made it to the beach or to bowling. I think that it was the Lord just enticing me to get me there. But I was fine with it. I was happy. And we went back, and we went back to school. I started carrying my Bible to school. I started preaching to people at school. I started praying for people at school. Middle school, 13 years old, 7th grade, South Sumner Middle School, and just saw God move. And then that same year, we talked about this Wednesday night not too long ago, this conference that so many of you guys helped with fundraising to send some of these youth. It was the same exact conference that they're going to in November. That year we went to Brownsville on spring break, around April probably, May at the latest, and, and then went, went in November we went to the same exact conference. It was called uh, just Fall Youth Conference back then. Now they call it Rise Conference. At that time I'd fallen down a couple of times. I wasn't as on fire. I wasn't as preachy at school. I wasn't praying for people as much, stuff like that. But we went to that conference. It was over in Lakeland at the, uh, what was the big church that was there? Uh, Carpenter's, house, Carpenter's Home or Carpenter's House. A uh, huge church. And, and I remember, again, that one was another time to go away with my friends. But we got into that, that thing, and that year the theme was, It's Your Turn. They showed this video. <sighs> showed a video of these incredible missionaries and showed their stories. It was showing all the things that they did, these, these indigenous people. They would go where nobody else would want to go. Where they would, many of them died while they were out there, but they, were show, they showed five or six different people, and they showed their name, and then they showed their death date. They told the story of how they died out in the Congo, or they died uh, ministering to this people group, or they, they, they served their whole life at their local church. And at the very end, it just kept showing death dates. And then it said, it's your turn. And I'll never forget when those words popped up on that big screen in Lakeland at Carpenter's Home Church. It said, it's your turn. I fell to my knees. I said, God, I want that. I don't want to go my life being a normal human. I don't want to be like everybody else. God, I want to be like those people. I don't care about a good job with the best money and the best cars and the biggest home, all that stuff. God, I want that. I want it to be my turn. I want to be able to get up and preach the gospel. I want to go where you tell me to go. Say what you tell me to say. Do what you tell me to do. I don't care anything about what this world has. God, if it's not in this book, I don't want it. It's just me. It's not just about the disciples. It's not just about the apostles. It's not just it's about the book of Acts. It's my story. It's my turn. It's your turn. It's about what God has called me to do. I can read all the books about Pentecost. I can read about Billy Graham. I can read about the apostles. I can read about Smith Wigglesworth. But my God, I am sick about reading about other people. This is for me. This word is mine. This word is yours. What it says you can do, you can do. Who it says you are, that's who you are. 
young people, you're going to a con the same conference. I'm going with y'all. <laughs> Well, they needed chaperones. They're making fun. That was a very funny story. I'll add this in real fast. When I was a youth pastor, the, I went to the same conference over and over again with my youth ministry. And we went, and the, it was in line checking those jokers in the hotel. We had 40 or 50 youth, and everybody's screaming. I used to be screaming with them. I was running around with them louder than any of the young people. And I was sitting there trying to fill up, and people kept coming and asking me questions. And I was sitting there writing. I'm like, God, I think I'm done. And I was. Two weeks later, I resigned. So at that, I was called in that youth conference. But we're, I'm going in November. She needs another chaperone. And man, I'm praying that God captures our hearts. I, capture mine again, God. But do something. Young people, no matter what age you are, this is our story. This is our story. We're part of this. It's still being written in us. We're still living this thing out. Revelation's ended, we don't add anything to it, but we're still living what it says we can live. Amen? And there's been a lot going on since then. <laughs> that was 13, that was 13, I'm 40, Maggie, I don't know, am I 41 or 42? <laughs> Is she in here? 41. <laughs> I mean, what's, pastor's the same way, pastor tries to shave them off, I don't know, I'm 43 maybe, I don't care. <laughs> I'm something. 40, 41, we'll go with that. 41. I'm alive. I'm still, thank God. That's the next part of my testimony. <laughs> now, a lot has happened since then. I went into ministry. By 18, I was in full-time ministry. Youth ministry. A lot of years of youth ministry. Powerful. God used me. Felt Him calling me away from it. Didn't know what was next. But was still with Him. I can never walk away from God. We had 13, I think it was, 12 or 13 years of incredible ministry. And during that, man, I didn't have to go through much. We saw success in ministry standards and saw God move and all these things. And we left. I was told to leave, but I'd always lived this way. This goofy little church kid. I said, man, I can't wait to my Jesus years. When I turn 30, it's on, baby. I did. I always said that. I said, I can't wait for my Jesus years. I should have thought about what Jesus' years were. He had some good ministry, but they killed him. <laughs> Beat him down. They hurt him. And so I was. I was looking forward to that. And God gave me these incredible years of not a lot of battle, just a lot of blessing. And it built me up, but it built me for what was to come. And we left Bush on Assembly God. We left on great terms. We just left wondering what God was going to do with us next. Didn't really fully understand, but... From that moment on, when I was turned 30, we just got married. That was great. But three months later, and I give this testimony, people, I, I've had some <laughs> rough things happen. Like I've been crazy and goofy all my life with four-wheelers and different things. But this was one, a real one. Just a few months after we got married, uh, I had a fever of 106.7. Should have been brain dead. And... Uh, Maggie took me to Langley and, and at Langley there in Sumterville I died in the back of the ambulance um, called the time of death everything and I was sitting there having a conversation with God I said God I, this isn't how it ends I know I'm 30 it's Jesus years but you got at least got three and a half more let me have that God I was literally having this conversation as I was watching them work on my body and I said God I'll go with you I will. I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm ready. Let's, we can go to heaven or you can send me back and I'll do whatever you told me to do, God, because there's a lot of promises you gave me. And if this is a wake-up moment, I'll take it. I shot back up, sat up. Those two men in that ambulance were freaking out because <laughs> I came out speaking in tongues. <laughs> came out shouting. And I'll tell you what, and it... I got I can't go too much longer, but I, I from that moment, of course, God brought us back. We've we've done ministry since then. We've we've had the school. Um, we've been here. We pastored at Coleman for a little while to keep the doors open. But through that, I tell you what, these past eleven years, I mean, we've been through a lot. It wasn't a cakewalk. We've gone through times where I was almost ready to bow down. I was almost ready to give up. Not on God. I could never give up on God. He's too good. I've seen too much stuff. I've seen the incredible hand 
at work. I could never do it, but I was ready to give up on ministry, ready to walk away, you know, give up on people. Because here's the thing, over the years, we've been very hurt. God never hurt us. God always ministered to us and brought us back. But we've been broken and beat down. And at one time, everybody left us. Family left us. Thank God for that woman back there, my Maggie Mae. We stood by my side and we stood. Stood with me, but we withstood some serious battles. We were thrown into some very hot battles. We withstood a lot of dark nights. And it felt like the enemy said, turn that flame up seven times hotter. And we've been through a lot suffered through a lot that's my story but this is what I want to tell you today the same way you'll hear you'll hear from Pastor Nicole and the power of God's might to pull from addiction and hurt and pain and suffering and Marty from hurt and horrible things and Pastor the man I can't even imagine I want to tell you this morning, with Him, you can stand through anything. You can make it through. Because here's the thing, there's a lot of you that haven't been saved that long, some of you that have, some longer than others, some just in the past year or so. And here's the thing, when you have Jesus as your Savior, when you've been washed clean, when You've been made new. You're a new creation. That's an awesome thing. There's nothing like it. But I'm telling you, there's going to be days where you want to act like your old self and you want to bow back down to the old things. My story is this, that I made a decision when I was young. And there's times where I, I messed up, I screwed up, but I've never bowed down to the enemy no matter what he said to me. That God has given me strength no matter what, that I was able to stand. And I'm telling you this morning, I'm still standing. The enemy tried to throw me in a fire multiple times and he turned that joker hot as possible. But I'm here to tell you, my story is this, I'm still standing, devil. Enemy, I'm still standing. And I'm telling you, I feel stronger than ever. I feel powerful than ever. I feel more anointed than ever. I feel more called than ever. The same way I felt called in that little Lakeland church and I knelt down on my knees, I know that today it's still my turn. I know that it's still me. It's still that he's ready to use me. I'm not giving up. And I want to tell you this morning, if you've been in the fire, you might have used to run away. You might have used to give up and and kneel down and do whatever you had to do to get loose and get free. I'm telling you, you're no freer. If you're running away, you're not free. Free. But if you're standing in the battle with Jesus Christ, you're more free than you'll ever be from anywhere else. And no matter what you're going through, you need to know that the flame cannot touch you. The Oh my God. Whew. You know, around the same time that I was a teenager, I remember a song that was out. I can't hammer dance for you this morning. I don't have hammer pants on. But I remember a song when I was a young man. And I remember, listen, you, I, you can't touch this. <laughs> You can't touch this. Come on, you can't touch this. You cannot touch the Lord's anointed. I'm telling you, that same devil that did it over and over again tried something else. Why You, you want to know why he can't touch us? He said, if you will submit yourselves to the Lord, you submit yourself to God, you resist the devil, he will flee. I, I, I'm telling you, there's been years of resisting. There's been years of battles. There's been battles that sometime were won in a day or a week, and then there's some that's been, that I've battled for years but I'm still standing. I'm still standing. I tell you what, if if you're in my men's group or you're in my my Wednesday night group, you know this, I'm very open with it. I've been struggling for three years. Overwhelming anxiety. Overwhelming. Cripple me. Don't let it affect anything. I keep going. I go find some scripture, find some peace in my prayer closet, and I come out and I still feel it, but I'll push through. But I'm telling you this, it's been almost a month. So I can say it again tonight. Along my my story is this, battle after battle after battle, and I was battle-worn, wondering when it was going to go bad again. About a month ago, 
Again, my wife, she's part of my story. She said, Dale, I don't want to make this, make light of this. She says, but when you have anxiety, whatever's going on in your mind, can't you just say what's the worst possible scenario? I've been praying through this thing for a long time. I've been reading scriptures and I just started thinking, man, he's brought me out of so much. Why am I sitting around worried about what he might not do this time? Because worst case scenario, I die. I already did that. (laughs) What am I worried about? I tell you what, and that was freedom in that. And it's almost a month I haven't felt an ounce of anxiety. Because I know that he's standing with me. I know that the flames are hot. You know what was so powerful about this story? When he turned it up seven times hotter, that flame got so hot, the soldiers that bound them, when they throw them in there, it killed them. I want you to know this morning, whatever you're going through, whatever the enemy meant for evil this morning, what he meant to kill you and destroy you, if you're walking with him and you're trusting in him, if you believe in him and you're, you're, you're trusting in what he says can happen, and you trust in his word, guess what? Whatever the enemy meant to destroy you will destroy him. Whatever you're tied up in this morning, let that fire burn your ropes off. Burn your chains off. Let it melt those chains. Let it, let's realize this morning that whatever you've done, whatever you've been through, whatever you're going through, whatever you're going to go through, it can't touch you when you're walking with God. It can't consume you when you're walking with Jesus. It can't overcome you. That's our promise. We're more than conquerors. So if we're more than conquerors, why in the world have I been sitting in my room for three years saying, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? When are they going to do this? No, I'm free this morning because I realize that this Word says that I'm more than a conqueror. He can't take anything from me. He can't take anything from me. Why? Because God has the authority. And if I have to go through some stuff, because sometimes we have to go through some stuff. Look at Job. There's times that you might have to go through some things and the enemy might steal from you. He might try to kill and destroy some things. But let me tell you this, God's Word never returns void. And He said if He did it, you can trust Him that He'll turn it for your good. Can't touch this. Man. Get that. Get that. You might be in the flame this morning. The doctors might be saying that it's over. Worship team, come up here. The doctors might be saying it's over. The marriage therapist might be thinking that it's over. You might be so consumed with the flames of... of, of this is going to happen or that's going to happen, that cancer is going to take you, this sickness is going to take you. You might have all of these things going on in your life and it's just burning so hard around you. But I'm telling you, if you're walking with God, you can rest assured that He is right there in it with you. That when the enemy that is looking in say, let me see what they're doing today. Did Robert fall today? Did Chris go back to it today? Did Clayton go back to it today? To Miss Janice, what is she doing? Is she fretting? Is she going through this? He looks over to see what, what, what my little handiwork might have done. How are they denying God today? How are they trying to walk away from God? How are they having anxiety and depression today? How are they going through all this today? And he looks over there and he's like, wait a second. Wait a second. They're not, Robert's not down there alone. Who's he talking to? I don't know who it is that's down there in the fire with them, but it looks like the Son of God. I don't know what they're going through, but man, I put them there and they're alone. They're talking to somebody. Oh my, the enemy's, oh my God, that's the Son of God again. They're talking to Jesus. I I thought I put them in a place where Jesus wouldn't get to them. I thought they were going to run away from Jesus. But they're down there saying, man, are they singing MC Hammer down there? Can't touch this. I'm still standing. The devil thought he had me, Marty. John, the devil thought he had me. He had me dead to rights. He had me at a place where he thought I was going to bow over and over and over again. But guess what? When I thought I was going to bow, I started saying, Jesus, you got to help me stand. 
you got to help me stand. And then I start thinking about the Word of God, that the Word of God says, you better stand. And when you've done everything to stand, you better stand some more. And then you better put on the full armor of God. You better put on that breastplate of righteousness. You better put on that helmet of salvation. You better draw out your sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You better pick up your arm with that shield of faith. You better put your feet ready to shod with the preparation of the gospel. You better start moving and going where I tell you to do. Because here's the thing. There's a lot of you that have been being destroyed. And the fire has been burning you up. And the things have been having and the the attacks have been going telling you if you have God with you you're walking with him if you have the armor of God on if he's with you nothing can touch you get out of it get past it you got addiction still let's get over it that addiction has no right in your life you're depressed there's freedom there's freedom anxiety there's freedom sickness there's healing Whatever you need this morning, prayer team, if you'll come up.